It's a pleasure to be here this morning and see everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, if you've <clears throat> been regularly uh, coming to Wednesday night Bible class, you know uh, I've filled in a few times. And in those times I've filled in, um, I've been teaching from Matthew's Gospel account. And um, it's, it's been a while since I've preached or taught uh, all the way through one of the, the Gospel accounts. And so I've been wanting to get back uh, to one of uh, these important books that focuses on Jesus Christ. And uh, I decided to um, do Matthew. And so if you have your Bible, <clears throat> please open it with me to Matthew chapter 3. And I'm going to pick, off where we, uh, pick up where we left off uh, uh, last Wednesday in our study of, of Matthew. And uh, again, if you've been coming to Wednesday night class, uh, we've covered chapter 1 and chapter 2. And uh, last uh, Wednesday, I filled in and we uh, did a little bit of Matthew chapter 3. We'll do <clears throat> just um, a little bit of review this morning and uh, look at uh, about half of chapter 3. Or sorry, we're going to look at all chapter 3. It's a short chapter. And uh, in this chapter, we read about <clears throat> John the Baptist, uh, his ministry, as well as the baptism of Jesus Christ. John is, is such an important figure in the New Testament, um, and as we'll see this morning, his, uh, his ministry was prophesied, uh, that he would come and he would prepare the way um, for Jesus. His preaching and what he taught regarding baptism uh, cleared the way for Christ and his teachings. And so not only does chapter 3 teach us about the importance of John as a prophet of God, but it also tells us a few things about Jesus Christ and his character. And so let's begin this morning with John's <clears throat> ministry. John's ministry. Again, we're in Matthew chapter 3. And uh, as I stated before, his, his ministry was prophesied. John's ministry was prophesied. Matthew chapter 3. And starting with verse 1, it says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <clears throat> for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now again, we get, if we go back to verse 3, notice that Isaiah prophesied about John's uh, ministry. And this prophecy of Isaiah is quoted in all four gospel accounts. Now, if you'd like to take notes, I encourage you to write these references up on the screen. And by the way, if anyone ever wants uh, a PowerPoint or anything, uh, I can email that to you uh, very easily. So if you ever see something that's interesting to you, um, just let me know, and I can, <clears throat> I can email, uh, email you uh, that information. Um, but this specific quote, again, looking at verse 3, this, this quote from Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. That's found here in Matthew 3, verse 3. It's found in Mark 1, verse 3, Luke 3, verse 4, and John 1, verse 23. The Bible only needs to say something one time for it to be important. But here, all four gospel writers uh, uh, quote this prophecy from Isaiah. And uh, it's always good if we have time <clears throat> to go back and, and look at uh, the Old Testament, what's being quoted in the New. And I'd encourage you, if you haven't uh, read Isaiah 40 recently, um, read more of these verses because there's, there's a, a few more details uh, of this prophecy than just verse 3. Um, but for time's sake, I'm just going to read verse 3 this morning, Isaiah 40, verse 3. So this is, uh, this is uh, the quote that all four gospel accounts have. And it says here, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And notice there's a little bit more. They only partially quote it. All right, so there's a little bit more to verse th 3 here. It says, Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, according to this Old Testament prophecy, John would prepare the way for who? Right? For the Lord. And notice this is, this is the Lord of the Old Testament. When Lord is in all capitals, as it is here, right? And I've highlighted it on the screen. 
This is referring to the name of God, Jehovah God. And uh, he says there very you know, plainly, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So this prophecy that Isaiah gave is about the Lord God. And when we read the New Testament, we see that John prepared the way for Jesus, right? And again, this is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They teach us uh, John the, the baptizer, he prepared the way for Christ. And so this is an affirmation of Jesus' Godhood. Now, others have seen the significance of Isaiah's words here, finding their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus, right? John preparing the way for, for Jesus. And one author says the following about this, <clears throat> quote, it allows the reader to see the Lord as Jesus. It is one of the several places in Matthew and throughout the New Testament where Old Testament passages about the coming of God are seen as fulfilled in Jesus, end quote. I mean, that's very significant. You know, here's an Old Testament prophecy regarding the Lord God, and all four gospel writers tell us it's ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Again, another author, and uh, he's referring to the quote from Isaiah found in Mark's account, and Mark also has not only a quote from Isaiah, but from Malachi. And uh, this author says, quote, by calling the nation to repentance, John the Baptist prepared the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah and Malachi joined voices in declaring that Jesus Christ is the Lord, Jehovah God, end quote. You know, the deity of, of Jesus is a foundational truth of the gospel. You know, do you recall Thomas's words? When Thomas saw the resurrected Christ, right, he didn't believe at first, he doubted. You know, he wanted to see the, the nail prints in his hands. He wanted to see the scar on his side, and, and Christ appeared, and he said, basically said, look, you know, here, here I am. And uh, we find Thomas's response in John 20, verse 28. He answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. And what's, uh, I think, even more important is Jesus's response. Right? Jesus did not deny this, right? Jesus confirmed this statement, that he is both Lord and God. You know, there's so much that could be said about uh, Jesus and, and his deity, but you know, we would be, be here for a couple hours if we you know, focus too much on that. Uh, but suffice it to say for now, when we look at Matthew's account, you know, Matthew does confirm the godhood of, uh, of Jesus. He is Emmanuel. He's God with us. And not only that, we'll see a picture of the Trinity in just a moment as well. So let's continue reading in Matthew. Matthew 3. <clears throat> Matthew 3. Uh, let's go down to verse 7. Matthew 3, verses 7 through 12. This is John's message to the Pharisees and Sadducees. Matthew 3, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism... He said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, and cast in the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into his garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So we look at John's message here to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he instructed them not only to repent, but to, to produce fruit, uh, meat, right, or suitable, we might say, in keeping with repentance. And so he encouraged them to repent. Uh, repentance is a prerequisite for baptism. Uh, moving on to verse 9, John predicted 
how some of the Pharisees and Sadducees would respond <clears throat> to his preaching. You notice the, the, the first part of verse 9, uh, he says, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. Right? Now why would some of the Jews respond this way? You know, here's John preaching in the wilderness, calling people to repent, urging them to be baptized. And he says, Now I know some of you are going to say, Well, Abraham's our father. Now, why would he say that? Well, some people would use that as an excuse, uh, as a justification not to respond to John, right? To reject the, the preaching and teaching uh, of John. Notice how some of them responded to uh, Jesus' preaching in John 8, 33. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? All right, so again, it's the same, <clears throat> the same thing, right? They're saying, well, we're descendants of Abraham. You know, we don't need to be made free. In essence, they're saying, we're, we're good religious people. Uh, you know, your, your preaching doesn't make any sense to us. We don't need to respond to what you're saying. And uh, we should know it's, it's never been the case in, in the Bible, even in the Old Testament, that just because someone was a descendant of Abraham, that just automa automatically made them right with God. And that's even uh, more important in, in the New Testament times. You know, here Jesus tells a story in Luke 16, 24, the story of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And both, we read about mo uh, both men dying. Uh, the, the poor man, Lazarus, he went to a place of comfort. Uh, but the rich man, we're never told his name. The rich man died, he went to a place of torment. And notice what he says to Abraham. We have this conversation in the afterlife between the rich man and Abraham. Luke 16, 24, and he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. He calls Abraham father, right? Meaning he, this was a Jewish man. <clears throat> he was a descendant of Abraham. And uh, just because he was a descendant of Abraham, that didn't save him. Right? He died and he went to hell. Right? He went to a place of, uh, of torment. And so we are neither saved nor condemned by who our parents are. Every person is responsible for his or her own actions. Right? And some people in the, the first century, some of the Jews, would have used this as an excuse. Right? We're Abraham's seed. Right? We, don't, we don't need to listen to what, to what you're saying. Um, let's go... Back to verse 9 and read the rest of verse 9. Can some some uh, would have said, you know, Abraham is our father. In the rest of verse 9, John uh, says, I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. So he's, in, he's, he's just saying that this excuse some people use, it means nothing. Right? God has the power. He has the ability. If he wanted to, he could create children of Abraham from, from the dirt from the rocks on the ground. So again, this indicates that being a physical descendant of Abraham is insignificant. Um, again, if you like to take notes, you could jot down Romans 2, verses 28 and 29. Uh, we're not going to read that for time's sake, but in essence, that is a, a passage which teaches us the outward trappings, the superficial things of a person, whether they appear religious or if they've done certain religious activities. You know, all that really is meaningless to God. God cares about the heart. You know, there's some people who were Jews outwardly, who put on a show of Judaism, who put on a show of faith, uh, but God cares about those who are Jews inwardly, uh, those who had uh, inward faith. Um, God cares about the heart. Now we look at verse 10, Matthew 3, verse 10. This is a, a threatening picture, a warning. An axe lying at the base of a tree suggests that tree's not going to be there very long, right? You know, the lumberjack, he's going to come, he's going to pick up his axe, and he's going to get to work. He's going to cut down that, uh, that tree. And so John here is using a picture. He's using an illustration. Looking at verse 10, what happens to the tree that doesn't produce fruit? Right? So evidently, he's talking about a fruit tree of some kind, maybe a fig tree. Right? Those were popular in that area. Uh, maybe some other kind of fruit-bearing tree. But the tree that doesn't produce fruit or the tree that produces bad fruit is cut down 
and it's cast into the fire according to the end of verse 10. And so John was urging the people to get right with God before it was too late. And so he provides this in foreboding illustration of an unfruitful tree being cat, uh, cut down and burned. <clears throat> now if we look at verses 11 and following, it mentions two baptisms. One, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the other, a baptism of fire. Now, uh, I'd, I'd take too much time to get into the baptism of the Holy Spirit this morning. We'd be here another, you know, additional 30 minutes or something um, for me to provide a sufficient answer to what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, so I'm not going to get into that this morning. But again, if you'd like to take notes, I encourage you to write down these references up on the screen. Uh, Acts 1, verses 4 and 5. Uh, Jesus promises the apostles that they would receive the power of the Holy Spirit not, not many days from then. And of course that's fulfilled in Acts 2, uh, where the apostles did receive that power of the Holy Spirit. And then also jot down Acts 10 and 11, a uh, very important verse, uh, not verse, a uh, uh, very important uh, passage, a uh, whole two chapters, uh, for us as Gentiles, where uh, Gentiles received the, the Holy Spirit, showing that God, once and for all, included Gentiles in the church. And uh, specifically there in Acts 11, verse 16, uh, verse 16 refers to John's words here about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so we find the fulfillment of these words uh, specifically in the book of, the book of Acts and again, these, uh, these references here. Now I would like to talk a little bit about the baptism of fire because I think it's sad that some people are so illiterate uh, regarding the Bible. They think the baptism of fire is a good thing. Uh, there are literally people who will sing to God and pray to God asking to receive a baptism of fire. And that is can just so misinformed to do that. Uh, this baptism of fire that John is talking about in this context is referring to judgment. It's referring to condemnation. In Psalm 1 verse 4, it says, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. You know, chaff is a metaphor for the ungodly, right? Chaff is to wheat what the husk is to corn, right? You, you peel off the husk and it, it serves almost no purpose. You can't eat it. And so you, you throw it away. And same thing with the chaff. Right? whether it's wheat or barley, whatever kind of cereal it is, they would separate the, the grain from the chaff and they would burn up the chaff because the chaff is, uh, is useless. Well, twice in our, our passage in Matthew 3, we read about fire. Look at verse 10. The fruit trees which produce no fruit are cast into the fire. And then look at verse 11. There it speaks about the chaff being burned, the chaff being burned. These are illustrations of the final judgment. Again, the condemnation of those who will not believe and follow the teachings of Christ. And they're described as receiving a baptism of fire. Now, Jesus uses the same kind of language, the same imagery. Um, let's go over to Matthew chapter 10. Or sorry, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And uh, this is one of Jesus' parables, and he also explains the meaning of this parable. And again, we're not going to read the whole thing for, for the sake of time. Um, but we will read part of it. This is the parable of the wheat and the tares, right? Or some people might say the wheat and the weeds. And uh, Matthew 13 Let's start with verse 27. Matthew 13, 27. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? Right? So they see these, these tares. Uh, it's a type of weed. By the way, if you ever look at pictures of the tare, it looks so much like wheat. They're almost indistinguishable. And so... Uh, they see these tares, the, these weeds in the field. 
and uh, they asked the, the, the owner of that property, hey, didn't you sow good seed? You know, why are all these weeds here? Uh, verse 28, he said unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servant, uh, servant said unto him, wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now Jesus explains the meaning of this parable. If we go down to verse 40, uh, same chapter, Matthew 13, verse 40, he says, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So again, Jesus uses <clears throat> the same imagery that John does, right? John talks about people as fruit trees, and if they're not going to produce good fruit, the day will come, they're cast in the fire. He talks about the chaff and how the chaff is going to be separated from the wheat, and the chaff is going to be burned up. And this is the context in which he speaks about this baptism uh, of fire. And this is referring to the final day of judgment uh, at the end of the world, right? Where Jesus judges the world and those who are condemned are pictured as being uh, consumed by fire. So again, this is not something we should desire or pray for or, or sing to God, bring us fire, you know. There's people who literally will sing that nowadays in churches, you know, sing to God about send fire on us and stuff like that. It's very bizarre. Um, again, that's just... This context is not about uh, any kind of good kind of, any good fire. Now, up to this point in Matthew, we've read about three different immersions, right? There's water, right? John baptized people in the Jordan River, so there's water baptism. Uh, the Holy Spirit is mentioned here, so there's Holy Spirit baptism as well as the baptism of fire. Now, in Ephesians 4, verse 5, it says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And uh, that can be confusing because here's three. And as you keep reading the New Testament, there's even several other baptisms mentioned. And so the one baptism described in Ephesians 4 is regarding our calling. Our calling as, as Christians, our calling as followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, there's one baptism by which we become disciples of Christ, and that's water baptism and specifically the baptism that Jesus commanded, right? Uh, Jesus commanded the disciples to baptize all nations, right? And so that baptism would be carried out by men. It would be carried out by the apostles and other faithful uh, preachers in the church. I cannot administer Holy Spirit baptism, right? I could never fulfill that command. That's something that Jesus alone does, and that served a very special purpose. Uh, so we're not, we do not become disciples by receiving Holy Spirit baptism. Uh, we become disciples by uh, receiving water baptism that, uh, that Jesus commanded. And so in that sense, there is one baptism, one Lord, one faith, one uh, baptism. And this act of submission and obedience is exemplified by uh, Jesus himself. Because Jesus submitted to baptism. Um, so let's continue in, in uh, reading here, Matthew 3. Let's continue with verse 13. Matthew 3, verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. And comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, right? Suffer here meaning allow. He allowed him. 
And uh, verse 16, Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus came to John, and John immersed him in the Jordan River. All right, so I have a, a few pictures up on the screen of the, of the Jordan River. <clears throat> and uh, this is just a reminder, you know, when we read the Bible, uh, these are real places. You know, the Jordan River still exists today. Uh, and in fact, there are people who are still baptized in the Jordan River today. Um, if you can make it out on, on this picture up on the, the left here, there's people who are going uh, into the Jordan um, to be baptized. Uh, so, you know, the Bible's not a work of fiction. These are, you know, when we read the Bible, it describes real places uh, that uh, many of them, uh, we know the exact location of them, and people can visit them today. So Jesus went to John, and Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. Jesus did not reject baptism like the unbelieving Jews did. Consider these following words found in Luke 7, verses 29 and 30, regarding uh, John the Baptist's ministry. It says, All the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of him. Now, Christ did not lack faith. Christ was not one who's going to reject the counsel of God. And so when he believed the time was uh, appropriate, he went to John, and he was baptized of John in the Jordan River. And he tells us why. He had a desire to fulfill all righteousness. May we have that same to, uh, desire today. Now, uh, let's briefly touch upon the, the mode of baptism or what baptism consists of. Um, in our text, look at verse 16. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. It states, it states here that Jesus was baptized. And Jesus, when he was baptized, now what comes next? What's the next thing Jesus did? Where did he go? He's baptized, and then it says in verse 16, went up straightway out of the water. You see that language? He's baptized, and he went up out of the water. This means to be baptized, Jesus went under the water, right? And I think for most of us here, that's just like very obvious, but not to, uh, not to a lot of people um, in the relig religious world today. Uh, so to be baptized, one must be immersed, right? One must go under the water and then up out of the water. Um, here's a, <clears throat> an old, somewhat obscure English version of, of the New Testament. This was put out by the American Bible Union. That's what ABU stands for, American Bible Union New Testament. Uh, didn't sell very well. Um, but this is one of uh, a very, very few translations which fully and correctly translates the term baptism. And uh, in the same verse, in verse 16, it says, Having been immersed, Jesus went up immediately from the water. Right? And the verse continues. Now, doesn't that make perfect sense? If you're immersed in the water, there's only one place you can go, right? Unless you have a death wish and you just want to, you know, stay in the water. But... <laughs> you got to come up out of that water, right, if you're immersed. Um, and we should understand that the word baptism is not a translation, right? It is not a translation. If you want to be technical, which sometimes it's good to be technical, it's what's called a transliteration. And uh, all that is happening is th the Greek word is just being put into English. The, the meaning is not being conveyed into English, just the Greek word itself. And so this will be a, a good, good review, I think, for most of us here. But just if you look up the term uh, baptism in a Greek lexicon, uh, that very top word, that's how it's going to appear in a, in a Greek dictionary. And uh, we can just go letter by letter and uh, transpose it into our alphabet. So here's the Greek 
beta, which would correspond to our letter B, alpha A, P, P, tau T, iota I, sigma, this thing that looks like cursive O, is a sigma, S, mu, M, and then lastly another alpha A. So again, it says ba baptisma, right? That's how, that's how you say it, baptisma. That is the Greek word. And uh, just to make it, you know, flow a little bit nicer in English and make it easier for us to, to speak in our English language, you know, the A's dropped off uh, at the very end. That alpha is dropped off, and it becomes baptism. And this is the word that we find in our New Testament uh, many times. And uh, again, this is just essentially, when you read the term baptism, baptize, and so on, you're essentially just reading the Greek. That's not a translation. Right? You're just reading the Greek. So again, this is what's called a, a transliteration. Um, so again, for this term to, to actually, for the, the meaning of this word to be actually carried over into the English language, uh, it would be immersion. All right? That is the, the meaning of the word. This, is, this would be a proper translation um, of a term. Now, someone might ask, well, why is that? And uh, why should I listen to you, Seth, if 99% you know, of English versions don't say immersion? Um, well, you don't have to just rely on my word. You can look this up in, in any scholarly dictionary, and uh, they're going to tell you that baptism means immerse. Um, why is it not translated in um, our Bibles? Well, think about, again, this kind of uh, older, more obscure translation I have up on the screen, where Again, if you are able to get a copy of the uh, American Bible Union New Testament, every time it says immersion or immerse, you'll never find the, the term uh, baptism in it. Um, think about this, this old uh, New Testament. How many Catholic churches are going to buy this version? In all likelihood, none, right? Uh, so this is, this is part of the reason why most English versions will not translate the term baptize um, as immersed. There's two major reasons. One is man-made traditions. Uh, when our first English Bibles, when the first Bibles were being made and uh, translated into English, people were already sprinkling infants and babies as a means of baptism. And so that's one reason that the word was just left, left in the Greek. And, and the second reason it's not translated is money. Um, you know, modern translations, I mean, as English speakers, we have so many options when it comes to English versions of the Bible. You know, some people are actually puzzled about which version they should use because there's just so many, right? There's, as far as just like mainstream English versions go, there's probably like nine or ten, right? And sometimes people wonder, like, which one should I use? Which one is best and so on? And uh, those are all interesting questions. But uh, you know, people who publish those Bibles today, again, I'm talking about new versions, right? Uh, versions that are made in the last you know, decade or so, um, or last few decades or so. Uh, those publishers want to make money. And they know if they have a version that says immerse over and over again, uh, people who practice sprinkling are not going to buy that version. And so they're going to produce Bible versions which don't offend people who sprinkle babies. And so even in, again, new translations, uh, this word is kept in the Greek. Um, and even if you don't know Greek um, and you just read the New Testament carefully, um, you can see from the context of Scripture that the term baptism implies someone who is Again, being immersed, they're being plunged into a body of water. Um, here's John 3.23. It says, John also was baptizing in Enon near to Salem. Notice it says, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Now, if John was sprinkling with pe people with water, uh, or babies with water, this context makes no sense, right? You don't need a lot of water just to sprinkle people. But if you're going to be, again, uh, immersing people, you're going to need much water. You're going to need some, some water. 
Um, in Acts 8, 38, this is regarding uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, Acts 8, 38 says, he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water. Notice this language. So they both leave this chariot. They both go into the water. And then it's only then we read that uh, it says, uh, both Philip and the eunuch, and then we read he baptized him. Philip baptized the eunuch. So again, there's a lot of unnecessary things happening here if Philip was just going to sprinkle this man with water. First of all, why did they both have to go into the water? Well, again, if you're going to baptize someone, you both have to get into the water. You know, I haven't baptized too many people, but, you know, I get wet too. You know, we both get in the water, and then one person baptizes uh, the other. And so we can know from the context of Scripture, baptism indicates a person who is immersed into a body of, of water. And, you know, that's, that's important if we really want to follow, uh, truthfully follow what the New Testament uh, teaches. Uh, we don't want to be, you know, changing something as vital as baptism uh, that is, again, connected to our salvation. We should want to follow uh, exactly what the New Testament teaches. And uh, I'd encourage you to jot down Romans 6, Romans 6, verses 1 and following, and Colossians 2, 12. In both those verses, baptism is described as a burial. So again, that only really makes sense if it's an immersion, right? Someone is being buried, right, and then raised again. And again, it's an illustration of Christ's burial and resurrection. And that's completely lost when we start sprinkling people or pouring a, a small amount of water on their head. Now, when Jesus was baptized, we're given a picture here of the Godhead, of the Trinity. Notice Jesus is immersed, and then we read about the Holy Spirit descending, and also the voice of the Heavenly Father. So in this passage, we have all three simultaneously, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Now, after Jesus was baptized, what did the Father say? Going back to Matthew 3, <clears throat> the end of verse 17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Not only does Matthew often quote scripture, but he refers to scripture or alludes to scripture many times as well. And as far as I know, there's no Old Testament passage which specifically says something like, God's going to say to someone, you're my beloved son in whom I, I'm well pleased. But there's a lot of Old Testament passages which reflect that kind of language. And uh, the clearest one to my mind is Isaiah 42, verse 1. says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles, right? That's a picture of, of Christ here being baptized, God's spirit upon him, and Christ bring, bringing a judgment to the Gentiles. Um, if you have your Bible, let's turn to John chapter 1, and this will be our last uh, passage this morning. Um, John chapter 1, I think this will kind of wrap everything up for us this morning that we've looked at. The Gospel account of John, chapter 1. The ministry of John the baptizer prepared the way for Jesus. It manifested Jesus to the Jewish people. And this culminated with John immersing Jesus in the Jordan River and the Father himself declaring from heaven that Jesus is his beloved Son. Now, with all that in mind, what we've looked at in Matthew, let's read from John 1, verses 29 and following. <clears throat> John 1, starting with verse 29, says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith unto him, or saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. 
And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. And the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. John prepared the way for Jesus. His preaching, uh, the baptism that he taught, it revealed the Messiah to the Jewish people, the long-anticipated Messiah. And John proclaimed here twice that Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. John's ministry was foretold of in advance. Uh, you know, Isaiah was written some 750 years before the events of the New Testament. Really is mind-boggling to think that, you know, those words were in so much in advance, and yet they applied to the lives of John and and Jesus. And when he saw the Spirit descend on Christ, it was then he knew for certain that Jesus was the one he was waiting for, the one he prepared the way for. You know, John said the following concerning Jesus: He must increase, but I must decrease. John 3, verse 30. Now, just like John, may we recognize the preeminence and importance of Jesus Christ, that we ought to give glory to him, and we must decrease, but Christ must increase in our lives. And it is through Jesus Christ that your sins can be forgiven. And so if there's anyone here this morning who's not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to follow his example and fulfill all righteousness and submitting to, to baptism. And it's at that point that you're raised to walk in newness of life and that your journey begins as a child of God. And so if you'd like to do that this morning, we can help you in, in putting Christ on a baptism. And if we could offer prayers uh, for you or help you in any way, please let us know by coming forward.